Special thanks to Neil and Rhonda Mill and all the volunteers. Thank you. The volunteers and the wonderful people that work for this museum. Uh, they, poor Rhonda, she and Linda, <laughs> I don't know anybody who works harder than they do, and my wife. And so it's such a pleasure I have to pinch myself that we have an A1 that flies that we flew that A1 uh, we're gonna have a talk this afternoon is gonna explain how it got to the United States that's a story in itself and there were four airplanes that were brought over and that's all I'm gonna say about it now but the fact that it got here is still here uh, and flew as long as it did is incredible it's beyond belief and 606 is kind of in that same category. And I'll let Ken Holston talk to you a little later about that project that's being painted um, at Delta Airlines right now. And it's going to be at the Cavanaugh Flight Museum in Texas. And both of these airplanes are, are the only two that flew combat for the USAF or USAF birds. Two others. Um, were training birds at Hurlbird, if I have it right, I think Ken can keep me honest on that. And they were delivered after we were winding down and the planes <coughs> went straight to the Vietnamese. So the combat missions are the ones that, you know, if you had a Formula One car, that's you'd like to have the records of who flew the, or who drove the thing. It's way value, things like that. So I think I've covered most all of that. I'd like my son to run a video before we start, and then I'll introduce the gentlemen that are sitting at the table. And you guys may want to step out here. I realize that's a problem for you. But it's um, Doc Blanchard, when I started going around and getting various and sundry photos, anything they would share, Doc had this in a can. And if you guys recognize who that pilot is, I'll talk about that in just a second. Did you say why they're doing that? Okay, I'll explain it. Yeah, okay. he's, he, he's get, yeah, he's on fire. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Don. Uh, <laughs> that's Jim Wold on the left. That's Paul Hooper. They're getting ready for a flight. Dinner. That's the arming crew. Which canister? Blueies, I mean uh, rockets, obviously. See that tail number on that first airplane to the left? 665. Bordering on freaky. Could be. Maybe it has an observer in the back. So that's 665 and pulling out to get in position. Play coup is a 4,000 foot ish elevation, less than 6,000 foot runway, I believe. And they're taxing for takeoff position.
Play two. Taken off to the west. And watch the second airplane carefully, please. Where did it go? <laughs> East or west? East. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I think the dip was out there where we dropped like that. I'll explain it in a minute. Um, Lloyd, if you can get some slides ready for play two and pass this off to Don. I want to say a couple of things. I was a brand new guy when I went to play coup. Larry Cavender and I arrived, so we're sitting over here to decide. We trained and we flew a few flights there, but we were the vets that flew uh, a lot there, and I, most people in Ola understand that. Because in its infinite wisdom, the Vietnamization process was going to move all the Thai, all the A1s to Thailand. So the six SOS was going to shut down, and the planes would support the troops in the tri border and so forth. We're going to have to come from Thailand, and the old heads that were around when I was there were saying that ain't going to work. And so um, we need the ones for Don. Okay. Um, anyhow, um, so Larry and I trained. And we were moving, this photo or that video was taken on the 19th of November. So that was a week after Jim Wold, Bob Carr, and I flew back in a three ship to begin uh, adding to five other guys uh, to have eight men at Play Coup for a month while they made room for us to move to Da Nang. And uh, Jax Roberts, John Weinig, Dean Detar and Mac Coleman were sitting up at Da Nang. The Air Force always wanted to have some A1s at Da Nang because of the Jolly Greens up there and the detached and the six would send guys on a rotation up there that varied from I guess as many as three men and two planes or sometimes four planes up there I believe. You guys can maybe help me there. Okay, of 69. So the 6th was destined to close on 15 November 1969. Nine of us um, moved permanently. Airplanes were being moved to Thailand. All of them were going to Thailand. And they were taking some of the guys that had enough time left at the 6th to go to Thailand. And some guys were going to go home early or other jobs. I really don't know too much about what all of them did. <coughs> But I moved for 11 days permanently, and then I was coming back. And they came to me and said, uh, we're sorry, Major came out and said, we're sorry, you're, you're going to have to go back to Vietnam and be in a unit down there. And I said, when can I go? I'm sorry, I just, uh, I was, and I'm not, no offense to any of the NKP guys, but, you know, that was the mothership with three squadrons and we came back and we started this detachment. What's confusing to me here is the fact that the person being hosed down, it could have been a fact, you know, but I don't, I believe that there were probably some operations of guys closing out. And uh, when we actually got back, uh, and this was taken a week later on the 19th, so four days after the squadron was closed. Wouldn't surprise me if somebody got their last flight in there. I don't, I just don't know, and probably never will. Um, I just wanted to make sure that uh, I covered a little bit about how Junior Larry and I were. And we have with us Paul Edding, Ederling, sorry, and we have Ruth Harris and Wynn DePorter and Don Deneen. And if he gets here, Jax Roberts, who was also in the unit for a little while longer, and Larry and I. Correct me, Don, or anybody, has there ever been a gathering where you had three or four or five, six SOS guys? 
at the at the A1 reunions, but not your own function, not your own show. Okay, so I want to preface one thing. This was serious business we did, and I came back on the 12th with Wold and uh, Bob Carr and landed, and we found out Jerry Helmich had been killed that day. And he was the last of the six pilots to um, crash and to be killed. They probably don't want to talk about this. I hope they don't mind that I mention that unit lost 15 airplanes and 12 pilots killed, if I have my math correct. Some other number? I don't know. Oh, okay. The whole, I think. The whole time the six. I think in the whole time the six, okay, <laughs> in the entire time the six was there. And the last thing I'll say before I pass over to Don Deneen, the six was created when the first was being moved to Thailand and it became the hobos. And uh, they, Don will be able to describe and win a, how that all happened. But it was a pretty hasty deal, and they were left four fat faces, and the unit moved, and then these guys came in. The critical thing is to them, for many of the men in this room, they were created to support Mac V. Saad. That was the reason the unit was formed, if I understand it correctly. It did a lot of other things. They were a full squadron, and I'll let them talk about that. Uh, and then we'll go to some photos of Play Coup area and stuff and at any time in our discussions when you think it's appropriate raise your hand we want to have questions this is an interchange and we want to have it be uh just that so if you have anything else and if is the mic helping do you think we should really try to use that i'll try to stretch this over to don then I live in Fort Walton Beach, Florida now. Uh, somehow I got this dubious honor of leading off this discussion. But like he said, the 6th SOS was formed, and I'm not certain of the date. It was sometime in September, October, November of uh, 1967, uh, because I didn't get there over to England Air Force Base where it was being formed until uh, just mid-December, and there, I know there were two classes of A-1 pilots out of Hurlburt that were, uh, some of them were assigned there during that period earlier, so there were at least two classes. Uh, Wendy Porter was, is, was the first de facto commander of the 6th SOS. He told me last night he got to, to England Air Force Base, he and uh, Bob Gokinar, they were uh, dragged over there by the actual squadron commander to, uh, they were both instructing at uh, Hurlburt, so they were brought over to uh, put some meat in the squadron right at the beginning. Uh, but he got there, him and Bo Gokinar, and they're the only two officers in the squadron at that time. And there were two A1s sitting out there. A1Hs. He'd never been on an A1H. They both got their gear together, went out and got in those airplanes, loaded them, had them loaded with dummy bombs, and went out for their first training <laughs> mission with an A1H. Uh, of course, he only had umpteen hours in it, uh, in the E model. Anyway, uh, they. Uh, the squad, when the squadron was formed, somebody in the Air Force convinced uh, Jack Ford, w Wallace Ford, to go back to Vietnam for his second tour. They were going to make him the squadron commander. Well, he went through the training bit, organized the squadron, got them all set up there, and when he flew out of England, we went over two uh, C-141s, I believe it was, or two of them, uh, dragging, a, dragging us all the way over. Uh, we, of course, we were left Louisiana, 
in the middle of February, first part of February, and got to Isleson Air Force Base to refuel, and they let us sit out in a cold <laughs> aluminum bird while they're refueling, and we're all wearing short sleeve, khaki shirts, sh khaki pants. It was kind of cool. <laughs> but from there, then we went on, I don't remember we stopped at Toyota or not, did we? Yeah, no. Yeah, it was a Toyota. And uh, from there to the Philippines, well, we kind of split up at Toyota. The ones that didn't have to go to survival school went on to play coup. The ones that hadn't been to survival school, jungle survival, went to uh, down to Clark. And when, you know, we got there just the, a day after the class started, and we had to sit there in Clark, play golf, and and do things like that for about a week before we could get into a class. The 6th SOS class that was there has a distinction. On the day when you go out in the jungle and uh, you go hide and they send the Negritos out to find you that night, and you got a little chip and a chip, and when they catch you, you gave them the chip and they turn it in and got a 10 pounds of rice or something like that. I don't know what it was. We had the distinction of turn, turning loose more rice that night than any other squadron, <laughs> any other class in, the, in their history. I, I know myself, I uh, crawled under some bush, got out to the edge of this cliff. Crawl, there was a tree growing there. It was growing out over the end. I crawled out on his branch, and I got way out there in the branch, well away from everything. Stayed there for quite a while. Got dark, and I'm out there about 150 feet above the ground. And I said, I proved I can find a hiding place. This is enough. I went out and sat in the middle of the road and <laughs> the path and <laughs> held my chit up. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't any sense falling asleep and falling off the tree. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, anyway, um, myself, I got to Herbert in September, left there in de December to England Air Force Base, made three ferry trips where we the squadron not only was training in the H, more. <clears throat> follow-on training, but we were ferrying aircraft. Some of the guys before I got there had been picking them up at the boneyard down in davis Mothin and taking them up to uh, rework Navy rework facility at uh, Quonset Point. And my first real flight in the A1H, probably had one before that, was ferrying them to uh, San Francisco. I and <clears throat> Jim Reeves and, uh, oh, what was the other one? Anyway, three of us gone. We, on the way up there, we went to Colorado Springs and Air Force Base, <coughs> Peterson Field, and uh, refueled. And on the way, we're, this is middle of January. We're about eight, ten thousand 10,000 feet. And all of a sudden, it's getting cold. So we got up toward Colorado. And I couldn't find the damn heat switch. I, I'm looking all over that cockpit. I was, you know, I was freezing. Well, we got to Colorado Springs. I was upside down in that cockpit finding it. I found it for the rest of the flight. Uh, anyway, Jack Ford was given his squadron. He arrives at play coup and gets off the airplane as he steps off. It's the greeting party from the base greets him and says, Colonel Ford, here's your commander, Colonel Rep. And he said, ooh boy. You were there Sad. when that happened? Sad day. Sad day, but, and it kind of, we got off to a shaky start. There were six, I believe it was six guys from the 
other squad, the hobo squadron, the first squadron, were left there or sent back there uh, to provide some uh, experience in the squadron. And we had about five or six guys on the way over that got sent to Thailand instead. So it, it, it caused a little tension until uh, those guys finally moved out of the squadron and, you know, went, went home. They, had their, they did their job. They got us, uh, got us the training we needed and all that. Let's see, where did I go from here? Anybody else? I just wanted you to know, you saw that dog that was in that video? We had our own dog. He's got, go he's got goggles and everything. He's a, he was a fighter pilot. Uh, let's see. Not well prepared here. Okay, when we got to play coup, we only had about four or six airplanes something like that so and 20 some pilots some guys didn't get checked out for maybe a couple weeks uh, i know i got my checkout ride fairly early and uh on the second i think it was a march my first ride was in a one of the b models to take you out kind of a let's tour the country and uh, drop some bombs and you get to see where things are and what it all looks like. And well, the B model, the, I mean the A1, A1E model, uh, had we could put cameras on it. You had a forward gun sight camera and you had a tail camera that showed you where the stuff hit that you dropped. And about two days later, I'm looking at the film on this first flight. We've been in a pass, and I see a dot go by. And I call my instructor, I say, hey, look at this, what is that? And he says, oh, that's probably a 50 cal. I said, oh, no more. You know, when we pulled out, usually, you know, you saw him out there going up, nice, smooth move. It was like that from then on, all right? It was jerky. Yeah, we got that picture of the uh, approach to yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah. approach to play coup. Yeah, We're rearranging this stuff. Okay, here we go. Stand corrected. East, you're always right. <laughs> yeah. The junkyard down here in the end. <coughs> the junkyard there in the end. Uh, I don't know why they put it there. You, nothing, nothing like coming in for every landing and seeing all those wrecked airplanes there. <laughs> uh, somebody asked me the other day if they were up there where the smoke is, whether that was Holloway f Field, and I. I think that's the town of Pleiku. Holloway Field in the 4th Division was over here further. Uh, one of our early debauchery nights was the guys flew over from the Army side with about three Hueys, picked us up, and took us over there for a party. <coughs> and they party two and then took us back. That was the hairy part of it. <laughs> uh, the buildings way up toward the back where you see that road going out the end, our hooches were probably right along that road. And we got a picture of the spad hooch. Uh, I had some of mine, but I didn't know if you had any in there. Yeah, there's one in there. Any memories? 
No, not that one. Okay. We got another. We got another one. This okay. one. This one right here. And you got this one. This is one. That's the one. Yeah. Okay. That's all the pilots and officers in the squadron when we arrived. Uh, everyone participated, except one gentleman there, third from the right, third from Wynn, from the yeah. Right. <coughs> I wondered for years who that guy was, and I finally found his picture in a previous training class. And I don't know what happened to him, but he left the squadron. And uh, the rest of them, Jack Ford is uh, the third from the left up there, fourth from the left, really. No, up, up there. A lot of the. A lot of you guys maybe remember Stretch Balmas. He's the third one up there in the back row. Uh, Jack Ford, uh, we pointed him out. The one uh, shorter guy in the back over there, right there, Paul Johns. I never, where did he get his training? I you know Jack Ford brought him in. He'd been over a previous tour. I think he flew T-28s then. But I don't know for sure. But both of them were KIA within about four months. It was not a happy time. Let's, uh, there are, for my tour, there are kind of three or four real special things that I remember uh, missions and that. And one of them was. Uh, with the blackjack in October. Uh, one of them was uh, Cam Duck evacuation. Uh, there's blackjack. The Cam Duck evacuation, as shown Newt's picture, the, the one way uh, over in the upper left, uh, that one right there. There's one photo, the only one I know of, with an A1 that was shot down, and that's just before it hits the ground. Who's here? Here's the man that picked up our commander. It was Newt Swain. He he was right there circling him as he went down, and uh, the camp was being uh, Cam Duck was being overrun at the time, as he said he was on the wrong side of the runway, <laughs> and. and uh, I thought, sure, that the first time I saw this picture, I saw a, a shoot up there someplace, but it's a real grainy picture. Uh, but that is probably the only picture in existence of an A1 that was shot down just before it crashed. <laughs> uh, Newt, he was a squadron commander, and he wasn't a young fellow. He was. What, <coughs> 45, maybe, something like that. I mean, I was young. I was 35. Yeah. Uh, Do you mind if I interject something? Yeah. At dinner last night, these men were sitting there talking, and they met. This has happened a lot of times. Or you did say because it's <coughs> just involvement between the airplanes and the guys on the ground, and once in a while they hook up, and there's nothing more special than that. Also, I would like to say a little bit about Don coming to SOAR and meeting Blackjack. Don Deneen flew a mission for him and was critical to those guys surviving. He guided uh, Blackjack down and a lot of other things that if you want to talk about. But I was there for one real special moment, and uh, I'd like to tell that story because Don meets Blackjack and he says, I'm not really sure I'm the guy that was in your book or what, or we were in the same place or words to that effect. Because this air stuff you were describing in this book doesn't, you know, too much fast mover stuff and other things in there. And Don, and Blackjack looked at me and said, I don't, I'm on the ground, I can't see it. I don't know anything that's going in the air. He said, so I had to just make that up. And he said, I thought, well, if I'm going to do that, I might as well embellish the hell out of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just a few. Yes, Snake. Yeah. 
Yes. Right. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. I... Uh, right. Well, that that was another experience. <laughs> Uh, as you know, our our primary mission was SOG and uh -huh. and SAR. Okay, that was primary. And unfortunately, a lot of times the birds <laughs> on an alert play coup. We get scrambled well, for troops and convoys. That was another experience. Uh, mission con uh, convoy. Uh, uh, as you know, our our primary those, mission was things like that and SOG and. Sometimes and we had are. to scramble sometimes primary. to find people and to cover. Unfortunately, a lot of times, a real bird sogging on an alert, a play coup, and, we and get scrambled for troops in contact, uh, mission con uh, convoy, uh, intercept, you know, things like that. And sometimes we had to scramble sometimes to find people to cover. A real soggy emergency, and in your case, I was out there with, got diverted from a mission I was on because there wasn't anybody. Uh, they wanted somebody close, I guess. I don't know why they diverted me, but uh, got diverted, and I had nothing but six 500 pounders and two 750 pound bombs on the board, and uh, they're not what you would call a close air support. <laughs> weapon. <laughs> and, and, and I hear this, I get on the FM radio, thank God we had those, and I hear this voice saying, hit my smoke! And he's throwing the smoke grenades over his shoulder. Now, I, I'm a, got a little bit of a dilemma. How, you know, how far can he run from that smoke grenade <laughs> before I drop a 500 pounder on it? So I know <laughs> well, it was a it was on a very narrow ridge line. How did you fit on that ridge line, by the way? Uh, a very narrow ridge line up near the Ashaw assembly up in that area. And they're running, it's, it's a fairly long one, and they're running along that thing, and I'm dropping bombs behind them. And some of them, uh, if I got too close to the smoke, I'd kind of drop them just on the edge, try to drop them just on the edge, so maybe it'd cut the top off the crest or something. I don't know what my thought was, process was, but I was wondering what happened to them. <laughs> You know, you lose. You know, once we expended the ordinance, there wasn't any reason for us to hang around. We had to get out of the way and let somebody else come in. Can I add a yes. Bomb story? Yes. My role in all this was when the initial cadre of the sixth. I'm Ruth Harris, by the way. As their tours wound up, my group kind of filtered in, and we carried the torch for uh, six to nine months until the squadron was actually closing up shop. Well, Don's covered well how our primary mission and carrying hard bombs to make cuts in the Ho Chi Minh Trail when we weren't doing our primary mission. So we'd be out bombing the trail along with all the fighters and then some problem would happen. Well, my little story of being out there with 500 pound and 750 pound bombs and, and uh, team from CCC is in trouble and needs help right now and we divert and Don's following Troll throwing smokes over his shoulder. In my case they're along the road and they're bad guys along the road and they're trying to make it to an LZ for, uh, for extraction. 
and we've got 500 pound bombs. Well, what are we going to, and there's nobody else there, what are we going to do? So we would drop one bomb on the trail while the debris is falling from the bomb. The team runs up, dives in the bomb crater that we've made. We move it. They keep their heads down. We drop a bomb 50 meters further down the trail or 100 meters or whatever. And we walked our 2,500 pound bombs down to an extraction zone at which they made a successful extraction. And while I've rested the mic, uh, away from Don, I'll just say what made this so special to the 6th Squadron was you guys, because it was the only, call my bluff if you can, it was really the only place where a fighter pilot would support the same people, get to know the Covey facts, go up to Contum and, and see what was going on up there, the team leaders could come down to play coup and uh, get away from the little people for a while, have a break, get unlimited hot water, and, uh, and, that, and you knew, regardless of what you thought our prospects for winning the war, you knew if you did your, good, your job well, uh, Americans were going to live that otherwise weren't. So it was a unique opportunity and a blessing for us to uh, have that opportunity to uh, work with you all, and, uh, and I'll say thanks for, uh, for all of what you've done. On the lighter side, uh, up at Contum, I learned to uh, eat raw eggs and uh, the, the raw egg toast, and I passed that on to two subsequent fighter squadrons. And, in a memorable going away party, which was uh, was one of uh, Don's first first uh, time, first experiences at Play Coup, when I'm sitting next to the wing commander, and you guys had taught me to eat raw eggs and do raw egg toast, so I'm going to propose a raw egg toast. The wing commander, unbeknownst to me, has said, "This BS." of the young of the officers in the club is go, of throwing food is going to stop so so i'd had some drinks <laughs> and some of the other guys had too i think so so i'm going to propose a toast that you guys taught me you got your your peers at ccc to the squadron and pop this raw egg and the shell, and that's that's the toast to the squadron. So I get the egg, I've got the audience, the rapt audience there, and the wing commander, unbeknownst to me, has been, the full colonel, has been getting redder and redder because what does he think is going to happen? Harris is leaving tomorrow. He's going to start pelting eggs in the officer's club. <laughs> Never crossed my mind. So the wing commander jumps up in my face at my going away party, the, the slick wing captain, and says, if one egg is thrown in here, rah, 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 rah. and I didn't handle it well. <laughs> I didn't. But, but thank God for Bob Carr. Thank God for Bob Carr. He's sitting in the back of the room. <clears throat> the officers club is full, and he says, here's to the six Special Operations Squadron, long may we thrive. Pops the egg and everybody eats their eggs and we sit down and I wander off to the 71st medevac to, for medical attention and, uh, and go in and apologize to the wing commander. We make friends the next day. And uh, so, I, so I feel like for a memorable going away party, I have uh, your peers at CCC to thank for, uh, for that uh, good, uh, good experience, and uh, thanks for uh, all you've done. Like Ruth said, I had just got there, and there were some things said by the wing commander about throwing things, and a couple of guys, a little roll, they kind of toss it over from behind that I saw, and he'd be out there looking. And it went from Article 19 to, I think, a court martial, but maybe I'm wrong about that, the threats. And I'm just wondering, what is going on here? And I didn't have any clue. I thought you were going to throw the eggs. That's what was going to happen. And I thought, boy, this is going to get ugly quickly. And then you did what you did, and Bob Carr did what he did. 
But that continued, and somebody else stood up and said, well, if you're not a fire party kid, he threw his egg in there, and I'm like, oh, wait, I hope, I don't know how this is going, but at some point I'm going to have to get up and do this. And about the fifth guy, as I recall, guess what happened to that egg? He blew it all over the table. They had a bigger mess than they ever would have had if they'd have let us throw them, you know. And, and so I, I just, I was in awe of you. I, I thought you had done everything ad lib. I didn't know you had some connection with CCC about all this stuff. And Roof, it was a highlight of my life. It really was, still is. Okay, now I've got to tell another Special Forces story. It just popped into my mind. So. So I, I go from there to Spanish language school and I'm in Panama and I've taken a mobile training team up to Guatemala and the third of the seventh group comes up with Colonel Dandridge. If you ever cross paths with him, he's running an urban warfare session there and they're staying at the same uh, pension where we're staying at and we've been there a while. The Air Force mobile training team and he comes up and we take them to dinner at El Siguan Quiche thatched roof, grass on the floor, and uh, so we're going to check them out in Guatemala. And they have uh, Lu Captain Luis Santos, naturalized Peruvian <coughs> Indian, Special Forces Captain, and uh, he's in the group. We have our dinner, and, and we've had a few beers, I'll, I'll confess. And so one of, the special, one of the Army guys, he's not Special Forces, he's an artillery guy, he starts eating his napkin, and what are you doing? I say, well, real men really eat their napkins after a meal. So, so, okay. So, we start kind of go down that path, and so I mosso traigan los tiene huevos crudos, and so he brings, so he brings um, the the waiter brings some. Guatemalan eggs out for toast and whatnot, and they have these super hot peppies, peppers in Guatemala, chiltepes, and so we're eating raw eggs, and Colonel Dandrich, the Special Forces commander, says, well, raw eggs are just mental. You gotta mix them with this really fiery hot pepper. And I hear, so we start that, and people are kind of dropping out of the group. There's probably five of us and five of them. And this is before eating disgusting things as a TV show, right? So, so Colonel, Colonel, I hear Luis Santos, the, the Special Forces captain, say, uh, have you got any uh, carne con gusanos? Do you have any maggoty meat back there? And the, and the waiter says, I'll, I'll go look, I think so. And, and I mean, I'm knowing, I'm knowing I can't do maggoty meat. So thank goodness, one of my guys, Frank Garza, so a big rice bug, you'd call it a rice bug, big, big roachy bug, comes flying in, goes around the bare lamp, bare light bulb that's over the table, kind of skitters to a la end landing, and Frank goes, slurps that big rice bug up, <laughs> chews it up and swallows it, and Colonel Dandridge says, well, we're not giving up, but let's call a truce and we'll continue <laughs> this another time. So that's my, my last Special Forces connection. Thank you. I brought every airplane I flew home. Uh, you don't have that picture uh, up there. I guess I didn't get it in there. Well, I've got it in another place, but it's on the hoist. Sorry. Here it is coming back from Song Bay one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I uh, had a, blew a jug and had to <coughs> land a fax, a little dirt strip someplace up Song Bay. I don't even know, remember where it is. It's on, it was south of uh, Pleiku, I know, someplace down there. And uh, spent the night with them. Didn't like that at all, being out there in 
who knew who was around, who was around you know. But, uh, got out the, the thing was parked right next to a road at the, the pad at the end of the runway was right next to a road and I thought that airplane's not going to be there in the morning when I get up. <laughs> you know, it was there and I don't remember how I got home but that's how the bird did. Uh, my seventh mission over there was a divert mission to a SOG. And again, on this one, Skinny McGinnis was the leader. He was taking me around, showing me the tricks. And he had napalm and CBU. I, some, and they loaded me down all the time with big bombs, well to wall. And we get diverted to a SOG. I didn't even know it was a SOG at the time. I thought it was just some guys in trouble. They were in a bomb crater someplace there. And uh, Skinny says, oh, I got you, you know, pop the smoke. I got you, OK. And he goes in, and he tells me to hold off, because I got big, big bombs. And he goes in, drops some napalm, and then he goes back and says, CBU and more napalm and whatever. And every time he went in, I was on the opposite side of the fit. I rolled in and made believe. <laughs> and I'd pull off out of there and go down about as far as I could, and I'd pull up. And we probably made about six, eight passes, and I'm zooming up and down, making believe I'm a fighter pilot, dropping bombs. No, I wasn't, it didn't drop a thing. It turned out that about two months later, this general officer shows up at our, from Saigon, and he pins a silver star on both me and Skinny. And I said, what the hell is that for? I didn't do a damn thing. Anyway, I figure I kept it because I figure it made up for a couple I didn't, might not have gotten. <laughs> uh, but I found out at SAR to SOAR two, two years ago, it was Bob Shippen. He, he remembered that incident very well. Um, speaking of ordnance, this man probably dropped more ordnance than most people in the Air Force. He taught for four years, five years at, ne at Hurlburt in the A-1. He had a tour over there in 65, went back with us in 68. I thought I had the honor of having the most missions in a tour in a, over there for 325 thereabouts, if you count a couple that probably shouldn't have been counted. This man had 637. 73, 57, 657 in his two tours. So I had a, his second tour he only had six, 323. So I, I might, have, might have edged him there. Uh, but to get that, you know, buried a friend of mine or helped bury him uh, about six months ago, and he had been in tankers. And they had a coin that said, you don't get to pass unless you pass, unless we pass you gas, or something like that. <laughs> and we didn't get to drop a ordinance to support you guys unless we had a load crew, Paul Edinger down here. For some reason, one day here, 20, 30 years ago, whatever, 25 years ago, I didn't have anything better to do. I went through my log book and totaled up all the bombs I dropped, all the napalm I dropped, and somehow I'd found a uh, table that gave you the weight of each ordinance and the prices. 
His crews loaded over a million pounds on my airplane and his airplane. I mean, those guys worked and worked and worked, and I don't know why he's not all bulked up, but you know, <laughs> as much, you know, 700 pounds, they, they, had, they hand wrestled a lot of it. The really big stuff, they had the list to it. And by the way, this stuff was dirt cheap. It was only about a buck a pound. So I spent about a million dollars that year. <laughs> uh, what else we got here? <laughs> I really came here to listen more than to speak. Uh, I was hoping to hear from you guys. But let, let me, I, I will, as Don was talking, I, a, f a few things occurred to me. First of all, I did not realize how significant the mission that the SAW guys were accomplishing until I read a couple of books a few years ago that explained it. I, I had no idea. Uh, I participated in in several insertions, uh, lots of extractions, most of them successful, not all of them. And at the time, I had no idea what that was all about. I just knew that we were being called on to help and, and we, we <coughs> did the best we could to help. Um, the more I listened to you guys, the more I recognized what, uh, what heroic actions took place on the ground while we were up there, cozy in our airplane, generally safe, and uh, we had a lot of advantages. Number one, our airplane carried a lots of ordnance, lots of different kinds of ordnance. Uh, it's amazing the things that we, that we were able to, uh, to load on that airplane. And we had communication. One of our advantages, we could talk to you guys. The fast movers couldn't. They had UHF radio, they couldn't talk to you. They had to talk through a fact or, but we could talk to you guys and, and that was really a, a, an advantage for us to work in, in supporting you on the ground. Um, the Sky Raider at that time supporting that mission was the ideal airplane, they could not have they could not have invented a better machine for the purposes that we put that machine to support uh, uh, you guys. Um, and like I say, I, I, I just didn't realize how, how, how significant your mission was and, and, and the part that we played in it. Um, I, I've, as Don was talking, I thought of several war stories that uh, that I know you would enjoy if there were time for me to relate them. There's not time, so maybe at dinner or something, if you want to hear some, some uh, really funny things. Uh, oh, give us one. Give us one. Well, I, I'll give you one. It's not funny. Well, yeah, it, it may. You might find a little humor in this. There was a team on the ground, and they were in trouble, and they needed help, and I had. I was the lead of a flight of two, and I had wall-to-wall -wall napalm. Now, one of the rules that we always uh, uh, adhered to was you never fly over the friendlies and expending ordnance, particularly low-altitude stuff like CBU and napalm. You just don't fly over the good guys, and um, you fly parallel or, or whatever. Anyway. These guys on the ground, I was talking to them on their Fox mic or whatever, and, and uh, they were in, a, in, in deep trouble. The, guy, the bad guys were real close, and the, the commander on the ground, the troop commander said, uh, he told me which direction he wanted, us to, wanted me to come in and drop my, my napalm. The, the, the bad guys, I guess, were really, really close. And the only way that I could that he saw that I could expend that napalm and, and help him was to come in over the, 
over the good guys, over him. And I, I argued about it. I said, no, you, don't, you, don't, you know, we really don't want to do that. And he said, yeah, you do. We want you to do that. Well, <clears throat> so I did. I rolled in, flew right over the friendlies, pickled off the napalm. And as I pulled off, I heard on my radio, I swear to God, this was the exact words. He said, you got us. Now, what do you think I felt at that time? My heart stopped. I, I froze. And I come back and said, uh, you know, tell me about it. He said, well, you didn't really get us, but damn, that was close. <laughs> How do you think I felt then? I felt great. And he explained a little later that the, uh, that the heat from the napalm was so intense that they did, in fact, feel that heat. And, but he used the wrong words when he called and said, you got us. Jeez, come on, man. That was a very successful uh, mission, and they were uh, successfully extracted a little bit later in the day. Um, I have some, some audio tapes. I took a tape recorder with me on a lot of missions, and I have some, some tapes at home that I go back and listen to occasionally of, uh, of our supporting the guys on the ground. And uh, it sure brings back, uh, brings back memories. Um, some of the war stories, I'll tell you, are like I said, I won't do it today. We're, we don't have time. You really don't want to hear. Uh, Ken Holston has heard just about every one. Uh, <laughs> he's sitting there listening. He's, he's saying, you know, you got to tell the same story. Don't, don't screw it up. Don't screw it up. Before you go, at least give them the short version of your fitting flight. Oh, well, it's not short. Uh, <laughs> My 657th mission came back to land at Pleiku and uh, pitched out, put the gear down, put the gear, uh, to put the gear handle down, and the gear handle wouldn't move. The gear handle was binding, and it just, it just wouldn't move. So I climbed back over the airport, put the plane on autopilot, uh, called the ground, told them I had a problem, couldn't get the gear down. And uh, uh, one of my fellow classmates, or, or squadron mates rather, Jack Gaffney, climbed up in an airplane on the ramp, communicating through people on the ground back to me uh, about what I could do to solve this problem. Now, I was on autopilot, had the airplane in a, in a gentle bank circling overhead. And I had a wingman that was watching every, the whole thing. And, uh, and he suggested that I unscrew a panel that's kind of down to the left-hand side of the, of the uh, I go back out there and look at that and find <laughs> out exactly where it is. But anyway, I was supposed to take this panel off, and behind the panel is some linkage that I could free up this handle and get my gear down. Well, I ended up unstrapping, turning myself upside down in the cockpit with my head down near the rudder pedals with a pocket, with a, a hunting knife that I carried in, in, on my survival kit. And using the tip of the hunting knife, I was able to unscrew several of the screws that held this panel in place and was able to peel back enough of it to get to that linkage. And I don't know exactly what I did or how I did it, but I was able to, to shake it and vibrate it and move it. And pulling on the gear handle, the gear handle in this airplane is a big old thing, and, and I was finally able to get the gear down one at a time over a span of about probably 30, 40 minutes, 30 or 40 minutes, a long time. And then I got back up and, and sat down and strapped back in, and, and, and the gear handle still would not stay down exactly. I mean, when I turn it loose, it'd go back up. It was binding on something then. And so I was finally able to put the gear handle down 
and push it beyond, there was a plunger type thing that, uh, I forgot what that plunger was for, but had to do with the emergency gear lowering or something. It goes forward and neutral and puts, isolates the hydraulics to the emergency extension. Yeah, so I pushed it beyond that plunger and that kind of locked it so it couldn't come back up. So the gear handler's down, the gear's down, and I'm able to land and taxi in, and that was my last flight <laughs> in, the, in the sky. Room. And at home, at home, one of the one of the ground crew there at Playku drew a cartoon picture, a big thing about this big, a big picture. I have it at home. I wish I'd brought it. That depicted the airplane and the pilot with his feet sticking out of the cockpit and uh, boats and nuts flying out of the cockpit. And, uh, and I really, I, I cherish that, uh, that, that picture. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I wish I had time to tell some. Hey, a quick question, sir. Yes. <laughs> Twice in one day. Twice in one day. And uh, and they needed pilots real bad, so they never they never grounded me. <laughs> I, I, I flew the next day, as a matter of fact. One of those one of those the first one in the morning. I was flying out of Quinion, and an army an army guy who was a Mohawk pilot. Uh, uh, what's a Mohawk? It's some kind of a reconnaissance thing that they... Anyway, anyway, he said, yeah, he said, if I can fly with you in the right seat, we're flying the E-model, two-place airplane, then I'll give you a ride in a Mohawk. Well, good deal. I'm getting me a combat mission in a Mohawk. So... <laughs> So he climbs in my right seat and we go out and again, I'm dropping napalm. I got too low, went through some smoke, hit the damn tree <laughs> and came back with, with dents, in, dents in the airplane <laughs> and scared the hell out of him. <laughs> uh, so I played it cool, you know, I said, well, you know, we, we, do, we do that sort of thing. <laughs> And didn't hurt anything. I mean, they put some some combat tape on the wingtips, you know. And the, the, the airplane wasn't damaged real bad. It really wasn't. It was able to fly again. Later that afternoon, I was flying another mission, and uh, my my flight commander, Kit Carson, was his name. Anybody ever run into him? Kit Carson. Yeah. He uh, he, he was he was. He missed the target. He just couldn't seem to hit the target. He had, we had wall-to-wall -wall white phosphorus bombs he had. Can you imagine that load? What a weird thing to load on an airplane. But he was missing the target. He wasn't getting in that. I was getting kind of uptight because, because I had napalm and I can hit that damn target. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to miss. And uh, white phosphorus bombs really put out a lot of smoke. I mean, a lot of smoke. Well, I rolled in to pickle off my nape, and I flew through the clouds of the of the the white phosphorus, the Willie Pete bombs, not realizing that the clouds were obscuring some really tall trees. And I went, I hit the damn trees. <laughs> and I mean, I really hit them. It it did a number on that airplane. It, I hit it so hard it jerked the stick right out of my hand, and so I I should have bought the farm. I really should have, but I was very lucky again, <laughs> and I was able to climb out and did a, a, a stall check to find out what the stall speed would be on the airplane, it, and I landed at Playku. I was I was on that mission out of Quinyon, but I landed at Playku, and I taxied in and. Um, uh, I, I landed that airplane probably 20, 30 knots above normal approach speed because the stall speed with all the damage was really high. And the guys stood there and watched me as I parked. Well, a lot of guys came out with cameras 
taking pictures. And I remember one guy in particular, and I think if I give you his name, you'll remember, a guy by the name of Bernie Fisher, Medal of Honor winner. Bernie Fisher stood there and took my took pictures of my airplane. I talked to him later about getting pictures of that. But that airplane never flew again. <laughs> they hauled it off to the boneyard and used it for parts. <laughs> it did a number on it broke the main spar. Uh, it, it really did did a tore the airplane up. I was so lucky to uh, to have survived that dumb thing that I did. But uh, I, someday I'll tell you a story about how I ended up on my second tour. <clears throat> I was having marital troubles. My wife was, <laughs> she was away a lot and, and we were on the verge of a divorce. And, and I was at the stag bar at Hurlbut and we had a genuine stag bar. I mean, it was, there were no women allowed that kind of thing today just would not exist. But at that time, it was accepted. And I was at the stag bar with Ford. And we were both shit-faced. <laughs> and Wallace Ford looked at me and he says, how'd you like to go back to Nam?" I said, doing what? He said, find the A1H, the H model, the single place, hot dog. I'd never flown that airplane. I'd been flying this two-place fat face E model, and uh, and he said, "How'd you like to go back?" I said, "I'd I'd love it." <laughs> so I signed up to go back with uh, with him as my commander, and as Don mentioned a minute ago, after we landed at Pleiku and timed off that C-141, and was greeted with the fact that you're no longer the commander of this organization, it was a very sad thing, very sad for me, and he was. He was, he was very sad because, you know, he put the squadron together and he had a bunch of volunteers for the most part, not all of them, but a lot of the guys were, were, were volunteers. And uh, anyway, so I, I talk to you guys over dinner or something and tell you some, or if you want to hear some of the lies I've told, talk to Ken Holston, he's heard all of them. I enjoy being here. Uh, like I say, I didn't really come to talk. I came to listen, and mostly I want to listen to you guys. And it was a real joy last night hearing some of the things there at dinner, and, and I hope to hear some more stories uh, uh, tonight and tomorrow, tomorrow night. Thank you very much. Well, enough of the war. We're going to get back to a little politics in the 6th now. Uh, about three, four months into the tour there, when we got there in 68, we got the word that we were going to have a three-squadron wing there. We we're going to have three squadrons of A1s. And they immediately made a wing, formed the wing, 633rd wing, wasn't it? 633rd. SOW, we became ACE, SOSs then, instead of the Air Commando Squadrons. And our base commander became the wing commander. He immediately pulled Gokenauer out of our flying schedule. Who was in his, Gokenauer had been an instructor for just like when, and they loaded dummy bombs on it, and he'd go out to the dump area, and every day for about two weeks or so, uh, about the time it took for him to get qualified. And the next thing you know, we've got a new, brand new guy flying lead. And birds on, yeah. And you couldn't correct him. You couldn't tell him anything. When he did what Wynn said we didn't do, was fly across a line one day, dropping some ordnance. And wingman tried to correct him, and that didn't go over big when they landed. Uh, but the strange thing was that about 10 years ago or so, in the Air Force magazine, 
I read a story about Birdsong, and he was a hero, B-17 pilot in World War II, brought back an airplane with us all shot up, people all wounded and everything in the airplane, and really became a, a hero then, so you, you never know what you got. Um, back to some of the sixth organization, which Don particularly was interested in. Uh, about the middle of March, we sent, four of us went up to Da Nang and opened up the, our SAR detachment up there. We had four airplanes, four people. They weren't expecting us. Somebody didn't know. There was no coordination there. We lived in the transit quarters the first night with all the people coming and going and drunks walking in and everything. Didn't get much sleep that night. The next night, we got them to move us into some BOQ quarters or something that was a little bit better. And, you know, at Play Coup, we had these low single story hooches, had the earth berms all the way around them for uh, protection. And if the siren went off, I'd just roll off my cot and against the wall, and that was okay. But first night we're in this BOQ in Da Nang, the siren goes off, and all of a sudden everybody's running like hell. And I said, I better run too. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know where the where the dugout, or the, where the bomb shelters were or anything, but uh, we eventually got some quarters with the in the jo Jolly Greens uh, set up. And it was not, you know, Jim Reeves told the 366 wing commander, you know, at F-4s, we don't get a better place to live, we're going home. You're not going to have a SAR outfit here. And they found something for us. Um, the other thing was, let's see. Oh, we never did get the other two squadrons. But so until, I guess you still had it as a wing when you got there, right? Yeah. He's still a one one squadron wing commander, which we didn't need. Uh, <laughs> I've, I had another story to tell, but I can't think of it right now. I was going to tell, you got this picture up there? Yeah, yeah. This picture was a Mohawk. Re SAR recovery. These are the guys who recovered of the Jolly Green crew and the guys we recovered, plus another Mohawk, which is right behind this picture, landed where we, at Da Nang, I guess, where we took the survivors back. And it was a brother of the other pilot. So we had a pilot and a co pilot, one recovery. And uh, I had that picture at home, and when I started putting this scrap back together, it was, you know, years later, and I could not remember who my wingman was, the man on the far right, Carl Richards. It took a hell of a long time for me to figure that out. But about 10 years ago, the co-pilot on the Jolly Green brought me flash that other picture back up. brought me this snapshot of a painting a friend of his made of that sortie. I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't remember Carl's name. I don't have any memory of this mission, of this going on. No clue at all. Still don't. But he said that he had this painting made, and up along that cliff line, on one side or the other, there was a 37 millimeter gun right above the site. And he says, I said, ah, 
they won't be able to depress it low enough. We'll just stay underneath them. And apparently that's what we did. But I still have no memory of it. So not at all. There are other ones more interesting, I guess. Uh, anyway, I went home from the 6th in December, I know, in January of that year. Minus one flight suit because the, the, the final party was a little raucous. But uh, I got home okay. Carol met me in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. If you're ever in a situation where they're offering R&Rs, and you're going to go on an R&R, &R, and you make your reservation for R&R, &R, but they're flying it out of Saigon, the airplane, make sure you get your reservation on the C-130 that goes through Pleiku to get down to Saigon. I figured, no, C-130, hell, they got all kinds of room. Comes in that morning, and I'm supposed to leave. I go out to the, oh, no, we're full. I haven't got a seat in it. I said, well, how about up in the cockpit? Oh, no, they're all taken, too. So I go back to Tuak. I say, hey, uh, base Goonie Bird available today? I said, no, we're restricted on flying hours this month. We, we can't go any place. So I went back to the squadron. I says, we got a E model that might not be on the schedule. Every airplane we got scheduled. So I said, put me on the schedule tomorrow. Uh, yep. I'm done. How much time do we have? Uh, um, Can I have five minutes? Oh, yeah. People have had the whole afternoon. No, I wish. I wish. But I was thinking of, I was thinking of war stories, and some of them are not of interest to the average person. But I thought this was kind of interesting. Oh, okay. Well, I'll only take three minutes. Okay. I'll give, I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> I was flying uh, out of uh, Benoit, in the E model, the, the A1E, and one of my early missions, I guess maybe number 50 or so, and uh, I was a wingman on a two ship. My leader was a guy by the name of uh, Vasiliadis, we called him Vas, hell of a fighter pilot. I don't know if you ever heard of that name, but he was just, he was, he was my idol. He taught me things. And uh, and he had a new guy in his right seat on his first combat mission. We always put a new guy in the right seat for the first mission or two, just to get, them, get their feet wet. And so the new guy's in his right seat, and we went out and we dropped some ordnance and came back to land at, uh, at Benoit. And I'm on his wing and made a formation landing. And I swear I lost control of the airplane for, for a reason I didn't understand at that time. They claimed later on that the brake locked up. I was never charged with any, any problem. The accident board uh, uh, told me it was, uh, or, or their, their report freed me of any responsibility. But anyway, I landed on his wing and, and I veered into his aircraft as we rolled out on the runway at about 100 knots. And I raised the wing of my airplane to try to, to fly it away from him so that I didn't run into him. So I'm rolling out on the wing with, with my full aileron, lifted the wing, and as, as I ran out of speed, uh, airspeed, the wing came down on his airplane. And we exited the, uh, the runway in a big cloud of dust. And uh, I, it, neither one of those airplanes ever flew again. We, I wiped out both both airplanes. Get, and get two more in your ace. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got I got to I got I got to tell you enough. Anyway, anyway, the guy that getting his first ride in the right seat with Vasiliadis with Vass, 
He went on to become a four-star general <laughs> in, in the Air Force. His name was Butch Vasilio. I don't know if you've ever heard of Butch Vasilio, but uh, that's the guy that was in the right seat. He said, hell of a thing to look on your landing and look at the belly of your wingman, you know. But uh, quick, one more story. Vass, Vass and I were, were, were drinking and partying a little bit at Quinyon. Uh, one of the places where we pulled alert. And uh, it was pitch black, dark. And we got the word back that there was an outpost under attack that needed help. Is there anybody that would volunteer to go support this army post? The name of the post, by the way, I don't, you probably know, never heard of it. But the name of the post was Doc Sut, D-A-K-S-U-T. Anybody heard of that place? Been there, Doc said. So it's uh, over in, it's in a valley with a lot of tall mountains around, all around. And uh, the weather was bad, and I flew Vass's wing. Vass was the lead. We volunteered to go. And um, Quinyon, we didn't have runway lights at that time. They, they, they lined up some jeeps along the side of the runway to light the, our way. Actually, it was just barely getting dark when we took off, but when we got back, it was really dark. But uh, Vass flew us down through the clouds. We broke out underneath, expended our ordnance, supposedly did a hell of a good job of, of repelling the attack, and a lot of the, they closed that place down. They finally got them out of there, and, and about... Uh, about a month later at Benoit, this was after my accident where I'd run into him on landing and wiped out two airplanes, uh, a general showed up to, to pin some medals on, and Vass and I both were given DFCs. That was for the night we flew the mission at Dock Foot through the clouds, and, and uh, it was really a... a both of us had, had, had been drinking a little, and <laughs> or we probably wouldn't have gone anyway. But <laughs> but anyway, they they wanted they pinned DFCs on us, and they teased the hell out of us about the reason we got DFCs was surviving this formation <laughs> landing where I'd run into him, and uh, and that's so everybody teased us and made fun of us, and so that's just another story. Okay, now I, uh, I'm probably the only enlisted guy that's in here tonight, uh, am I right? <laughs> right over there? Okay. Now I've got some stories I can go back home and tell my enlisted buddies what the officers do in their spare time. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was in the ordinance, I was the uh, weapons uh, mechanic and so I was involved with putting all these good things on it. You guys got to fly around and blow things up with. Um, some of the weapons I dreaded putting on. And one of the weapons I didn't like to put on was the napalm. It was not because what the napalm was designed for, but it had a very thin skin. And it had this here little fuses you put in there. There were clay pots. And if the clay pot had a little crack in it, you were in danger of that thing starting to go off. And we had water barrels, uh, one on each end of the, the flight. Do you remember them? Yeah. Had 55 gallon drums of water. And if that thing was uh, leaking any, you had to get that into the water or get it out of your way or it's gonna end up on your hands. And uh, it don't go away, at will it peak don't go away. Um, the second thing is I never liked to load the 2.75 rockets. Uh, the ones that we had to take off the trailer and hand them and stick them into the tubes because if there's any static electricity, that thing was coming back out. And uh, so you didn't want to be uh, in front of one of them when you're loading. And you always know what I'm talking about, the uh, 2.75 folding fins. But uh, they, were, they were a nasty thing. Uh, they did a lot of good work. And... Uh, the 20 millimeter guns had some problems. 
they were like Don told me one time that they weren't the ammo was not bore safe and I wasn't sure what bore safe was because he didn't tell me that in training but basically uh, it could go off in the barrel uh, if another round come up behind it if it failed to go all the way out the, the barrel the bore safe stuff had to spend too many times so many times yeah so uh, but the uh, we was running into problem with feeders uh, the feeders was what they carried the rounds over to the gun itself and uh, we were having trouble getting parts uh, for the feeders and and the gun shop we had to take guns down to the other end of the runway to the gun shop down there so the 20 millimeter guns were uh, a problem to work on sometimes but the feeders on the outboard guns, we found that if you put 60 rounds per box, and there was three boxes that went out into the wing, it found out that the feeders would last longer. So uh, we, that's what we went and adopted later on. But the uh, mini guns was a, a gun that was very handy, very easy to work on, very easier to fire off on the ground. Uh, <laughs> I I was at the end of the runway one time, and um, uh, I was the lead on the crew, uh, four men, and uh, so we yanked off the uh, the cowling on it, was putting the safety pin in, and just as I started to put the safety pin down, the gun went off. The pilot motioned for me to come up on his wing, so I got up on his wing. He said, "You fired one off." And I said, are you sure? And I was making it look like it. I really didn't think that happened. And uh, so in the meantime, the guys had grabbed the gun, and there's only two little Clico pins that held that thing in place, grabbed that gun and threw it in the back of our gun truck. And uh, he wanted me to follow him back into the revetment, so I got down there. And uh, he said, you know we're going to have to write a report on this. I said, come here a minute. Took him back to the truck and had canvas on the back of our truck and I raised it up. I had six mini guns laying down there. And I said, can you identify which one of these is yours? And he said, he said no, I can't. And I said, well, how can you be sure I fired one off in? <laughs> so, so, but another time incident that uh, Ordnance is dangerous, by the way. Uh, if you haven't figured this out, uh, it is dangerous. And it's even more dangerous if you have somebody that, uh, like me on it. But, but uh, one night, uh, we had night planes coming in from a mission. And we just got done, and I was on a low crew, and another guy was the lead on it. And uh, he was a staff sergeant. He was looking up under the after we got done, and got looking up under the gun exit for the projectile casings to come out of, and uh, he said, "I see some brass on a, one of the one of the 20 millimeters." And I said, "Okay, what do you want me to do?" I was the number two man on the team, and that was the guy that goes in the cockpit and sets up the switches and makes sure everything's in order. He said, "We'll run some hydraulic power up on that and see if we can push that thing forward." Well, I run the power up and pushed it forward as much as it would go, and it wouldn't go any further. So he looked at it, and instead of doing what he should have done, was ordered the uh, feeder to be removed and then bring the bolt forward. I uh, was told to pull the trigger once. There was a plane just taxied in front of me. Four rounds went right over top of that plane at night. I was scared to death. Not only did I shoot over the top of a plane, but it, I never heard a 20 millimeter go off in a revetment before. <laughs> the very noisy. So, uh, but it, uh, on the good side, is the guy didn't, the pilot didn't come back and shoot me, which is because he was, he got up on the wing and he wouldn't let me out of there until the uh, air police got there and uh, they decertified our crew. Uh, then they turned around after we wrote a, uh, a report out, 
they turn around and had us to load another plane and recertify us because there's only two load crews at night and they had to have both of them to get the next missions out the next day. So uh, that's the way that went. But uh, I did spend 90 days at Da Nang. What was the average time to load on our airplanes? About two and a half hours? Depending on the, the type of load. Um, if things went well with napalm, and usually napalm was a straight load of eight bombs, um, an hour on napalm. Uh, hard bombs is an uh, hour and a half because you have the arming wires that have to be positioned, the arming fuses that have to be positioned, and everything like that. And sometimes we had to put and tail the fans sar on. Sar mixes, sar mixes take more time. Well, that's interesting you said that because I didn't know I was involved with SOG until I was looking on my DD-214. <laughs> uh, that is uh, uh, another thing is that the uh, enlisted people were pretty well kept in the dark on what was going on. We, we knew the planes were going out, taking their bombs out and doing something with them and coming back. But we didn't know where they went or what they did. We didn't get reports. And uh, that's one thing I kind of think that would have been good uh, for the morale of the troops on the ground if they saw or heard what was going on. But what I did like, the idea is them going out and dropping bombs on somebody, was that they may have been stopping somebody from shooting rockets at us. And that's what I always kept in my mind. Um, but at uh, Da Nang, uh, our first thing we'd do in the morning was go out and check the planes uh, after we had a five o'clock uh, breakfast. Check them, make sure everything was the same way it was the night before. And if it wasn't, then we had to do something about it. And if a plane broke during the night from hydraulic leaks or something, we would have to do uh, work on the planes. But um, while I was there in the mornings, there was a blue bus that came up And <clears throat> it was a, a hospital bus, and uh, it had the Red Cross on the side, and the air police was right there beside the, uh, our planes, and uh, I asked him what was that bus about, and he said that uh, those guys are going to be shipped out to get better medical care in Japan, Germany, or maybe back to the States. And the next next day, I always went out there and waved, thinking maybe somebody would see me. Those guys were paying the price. I can just uh, attest to the napalm comment and not really like to work with napalm that um, having a napalm ignite under the wing of your airplane is really an attention-focusing thing I can attest to. I'd like to uh, say a couple of words. If I, could. I, I, I got just one short go comment go on, the, on, the, on the armament. We, we developed some in-house techniques, and we found out that with a 50-pound frag bomb and a can of napalm, if you drop the napalm and counted two, one thousand, one thousand, two, and drop the 50-pound frag bomb, they both hit just about the same place at the same time. And at night, that's really spectacular. And all that's. <laughs> One of the reasons I started doing this is a man named Gary Bain. And uh, I don't have to go into all the details, but he was the one that said, you know, you can get on the internet and you can find out a lot of things. And that led to many, many good things. And I thank him greatly for doing that. And Gary Bain had a SAR at Play Coup that Ruth Harris was very involved in. 
And I would like to play a little trailer if it's going to work on here and the audio is going to come through. He would like to do, he, he's kind of dedicated his life to uh, trying to get, he'll probably have to go in uh, uh, VLC. Let's see if it will work here. Here we go. No audio. It's skipping around. Okay. I hear it trying to come in. Here we go. I don't know if the audio is. Okay.
Gary Bain was in a bad auto accident a um, number of weeks ago, or he'd be here. He had 12 A1s overhead uh, at various times, three hours on the ground, and one for sure stood out. That was Roof Harris. And Roof did not, I believe, yield it to the Sour birds that were going to come. I've heard the audio about that because they had better equipment, the right stuff, and you waited a few minutes. And I know that Gary knows how well you dropped, and it's a really serious uh, matter to him. His back cedar was just buried at Arlington. They finally found him. Gary's been over to Laos to uh, look for him or go to sites on a couple of occasions. And John Glenn had a burial there, I believe, just a month or two ahead of when his Rio was uh, finally recovered. And he had that Rio had about half again as, uh, over what John Glenn had. It was a long, long journey. But guys like Ruth Harris and the other men there, you know, they make a difference. We do it for our own guys, too. We do it for the SOG guys. And with that, I think we'll shut this part down, unless somebody else has a story. And we'll try to go to lunch and get back inside an hour or quickly as we could. Uh, we don't have our, we'll have a lunch. Um, so basically back here by two o'clock, if you could please, because we have another presentation that I think is gonna be off the charts. And, um, we're going to talk about how the airplane that's on the ramp and the other four airplanes got back, and uh, it's quite a story, and we'll go through that. We have a PowerPoint, thanks to Ken Holston for that. It'll be a little better prepared than my theater here is. And so there are a lot of places you can eat here. If you go out the front, you can turn right and you can get yourself to a Dairy Queen. If you go back down the road to the left, there's everything from Mickey D's. There's just a lot of different restaurants. I'm not uh, ace of the base about advising. And you're welcome to hang around here, too. Um, but uh, most old people want to eat something. <laughs> so if we come on back, but I don't want to have us run over the other presentation. And there's a chance, I don't know where it's at right now, of Neil flying his plane out to meet the other A1 that's supposed to be coming here today, if it'll make it from Colorado Springs. So a round of hand for six guys, please. You have me inside, have me inside. Shot on three, King 27 has your bingo this time. Okay, I'm going to fly down the river, down the river. Tell me when I'm over your location, over your location. A bit longer until uh, Alamo 2 gets in a little bit of shape. Yeah, I'm going to wait another five minutes early. Okay, so we'll hold you another five minutes. Three, two, one, Victor. Go ahead. Uh, sure, you keep everybody uh, in line and back there at the IP. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, still with Okay, babe, how far was I? Was I right over you? Was I right over you? Stand by one, stand by one. I'm going to take another cut at you. Give me a call when I'm right over you. Okay, 